Okay, guys, we'll, we'll make a start. I'm sure others will join as we go through the webinar, but that's fine. For now, I'm just going to whack everyone on mute if they're not on mute already. So if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and just ask away. Uh, so the, the plan is I'll, I'll take you through a few quick short slides and then hand over to Kevin Allen, our CTO, to actually take you through the, the demo of the, the partial failover. So DRAS is not a new product for us. It's, it's been available on our platform for some time now. I mean, it's only really beginning to gain some serious traction. And, and why is that? Well, in my opinion, um, there's been some common misconceptions about DRAS in the marketplace, uh, specifically around affordability, suitability for SMB environments, and complexity to, to, to manage and operate. I'll cover on those points a little bit later on. As we're beginning to show our partners how cost-effective and simple DRAS can be, we're starting to see a shift in that mindset. So that's one, one part. The second is really the rise of ransomware. So the rise of ransomware and the impact that downtime is having on businesses is also playing an important part. So SMBs no longer have a tolerance for downtime. So they're looking to solutions like DRAS to ensure that their systems and their data are, are always available. So in terms of the partner levels that we have available to our customers, DRAS is available on all but Flex. For all our bronze, silver, gold, platinum and diamond partners, DRAS is available. Um, as you probably know, we have six data centres around the globe. So we're in Sydney, Melbourne, Perth. Uh, we also have a presence in New Jersey, in the US, um, in the UK, as well, as well as South Africa. DRAS is available right now in Sydney, Melbourne and Perth. So everyone on this call, uh, I'm sure, is familiar with the concept of disaster recovery as a service. So essentially, Probax allows you to replicate your local Veeam protected servers and turn them on in our cloud in the event that the on-premise servers be fail or become unavailable. In theory, uh, DR is, well, it should be straightforward, right? So it, it's usually a piece of tape to spin up a VM from, from your backup images. But the hard part has always been the networking side of things. So how do you make one machine running in the cloud accessible to the rest of the client network? And I guess that's the beauty of Veeam. And that's where their network extension appliance comes in. So Veeam's uh, network extension appliance does all that work for you and it really does make the failover and the failback uh, process extremely seamless and you'll see that in, in the demo. So there's three reasons why we decided to go with Veeam for this. So there's plenty of other solutions out there in the market but we essentially chose Veeam because uh, number one, as I mentioned already, the built-in network extension appliance makes failover and failback super easy. Number two, it's, it's really cheap, and I'll cover off on pricing uh, in the next slide. And number three, it just works, right? So as an MSP, um, you really want peace of mind that the solutions that you provide to your clients are actually going to work. And I guess clients uh, are looking for that peace of mind too. And again, you'll see this in the demo, but the way to configure and, and operate and, and fail over with, with Veeam, it, it, just, it just works. So we're supporting both uh, Windows Hyper-V and VMware ESX environments. Pricing is based on total compute, total memory, and total storage. So if you're looking to have three, a three VM environment in the cloud, you, you need to add up those three components. Networking also plays a part. So in the event that you need public IPs, you know, that, that forms part of the pricing plan. And again, I'll take you through this in the next slide. So CPU, RAM, storage, and networking is essentially the components of the hardware plan. The other thing you need to be mindful of is your Veeam licensing. So if you're already doing Veeam backups, then you'll typically have a BNR license already. The other thing you need to be aware of is that when you start to replicate that to our cloud, there's a Cloud Connect for replication fee that's involved as well. Unlike other solutions in the market, we won't give you a quota for bandwidth. We don't charge you a failover fee. You purely just pay for the CPU, RAM, storage, and, and networking components that you require. Uh, I guess the last slide before we jump over into the demo is um, I spoke a bit earlier about the common mis misconceptions about DR. So there's, there's three of them in my opinion. The first is that DR is only for enterprise. And again, I spoke about why or more that SMBs no longer have a tolerance for downtime, right? So they're essentially demanding enterprise level DR. They don't always want to pay for it, but that's their expectation. The second is DR is too expensive for SMB. From a pricing point of view, again, going back to the hardware plan, you essentially 
pay for total compute, total RAM, total storage, and network and licensing. So this is a real life example of one of our partners based in Adelaide. They've got a customer who has three VMs. So there's a DC, there's a file server, and there's a terminal server. For them to have an environment on standby to spin up at any time when uh, there's a DR or one of their servers fail, it's going to cost them $432.50 per month. The other thing is, uh, if you do need to fail over to our environment, we, we charge a daily failover rate. So they're the two things that you really need to be aware of, the monthly standby rate and then the daily failover rate. As I mentioned before, there's no, no charge to, to test. You can test however often you like, and we don't charge any quotas on traffic. So if you spin up in our cloud, you, you can use as much data as you need to for as long as you want. Uh, and the third one uh, is that DR is too complex and time consuming. So for that point, I'm going to hand over to Kevin uh, now to take you through the, through the demo. How you doing guys? Uh, hope you're all keeping well. So Sam's, um, uh, Sam will start up the video in just a minute, um, but I guess the, the first part would be um, just to have a quick talk about a full site failover. So um, in a full site failover, we've basically got uh, all the VMs um, in, a, in your customer's environment coming up at once. Um, that network extension appliance that Sam spoke about is, is acting out like a virtual router. Uh, all of the port forwards that you had um, previously configured, they'll be set up so that they, um, they go to the service that you want. And it's basically, uh, we give you the public IP ahead of time and you start that, uh, start that environment up without, the, without needing to have access to their local BNB and R at all. In terms of, of a full site failover, uh, it's really good and really easy to test. And, the, and then when you fail back, you just use the, uh, the Veeam's built-in failover process or failback process when you've got that site back up. Um, and all the changes will be uh, moved back. So now in terms of the partial site failovers, this is probably the coolest thing uh, that you can do with Veeam. So, um, so we've recorded a, uh, a video here, which I'll just get Sam to, uh, to start up. So what I've got here is I've got a um, just a small virtual environment. I've just started a VM. I've just created a VM, and I'm going to uh, start up a ping here, um, just so you can see the um, that I've got this VM online. Um, it's just a small uh, WordPress site. So the reason why I've done that is it's a web server, also runs a small database, um, just so you can see what's going to happen once we uh, we fail over and fail back. So I'm going to simulate a VM failure by um, by turning the VM off. And then um, we'll go back to our uh, to our machine here. We're going to go to our replicas, and we can see that we're going to initiate a partial failover. We're just going to click on um, failover now on the Sydney, um, and we choose Sydney because uh, this particular environment is running in Perth, uh, and I want to show you uh, the latency difference between the two. So when we go into the failover wizard, we can choose the restore points that we want to restore from. Um, this one here has, uh, is quite old, but that's totally fine for what we're going to um, show today. Just going to do some validations, and then it's going to start the failover process. So the good thing with Veeam is it's going to uh, give us lots of detailed information as to what it's doing um, and exactly how long each part is taking. Um, so we'll actually... Um, uh, I'll actually speed up parts of this in just a minute, but you can see my ping window there is um, stop responding to ping since we turned that VM off. Um, and then what we've got on the local side there is we've got the network extension appliance, which is turning on. So we can see on the uh, on the right-hand side window, um, the server side settings partial failover on. Um, we're turning on our um, network extension appliance. Uh, on the client side, and what that's also going to do is turn on a network extension appliance on the server side, so on our side here. What those are going to do is um, those two NEAs are going to talk to each other. They're going to stretch a VLAN between that one VM that we're failing over and the rest of the network back in the client side. So we can see that's happening now. And then our pings start running, so we're using that local IP to connect to that VM. Uh, which is running in the cloud. So you can see we're looking about 60, 70 millisecond ping. Um, so we can tell that that is, um, in fact, running in the cloud there. So what we do, we're going to go to this WordPress site. We're just going to make a small change to that site. 
So again, we're accessing it with the local IP. Um, so from the, from the local environment, it's going to act as if it was on that same network. So all the other servers that are there are going to see, see it without needing any DNS changes or anything like that. So we just log into WordPress. I'm going to jump on this post here. And I'm just going to make a little change so that we can show the file back. And save that. I'm just going to visit the site just so that we can verify that, that we've made that change. And then we're going to go back into uh, into our Veeam. So we're going to initiate a failback to production. So there's a couple of different options that we've got. So we could either undo a, a failover. So let's just say you've got your environment back up and running. Um, you don't want to fail any changes back to production. Um, you can just undo it and that will stop it running on our side. Um, in this case, we want those changes that we've made um, running in the cloud to be failed back. So we're going to use the failback wizard here. And we can choose, there's a few different destination options here. So we can fail back to the original VM. Um, uh, we can put it to a VM in a different location. Um, and we can uh, just pass that one there. So basically, uh, once we're doing the, going through the failback wizard, we can power on the VM after restoring as well. And then again, it's going to pop up um, the restore session. And it's quite descriptive on what it gives you here. So we can see that our pings, are, um, they're still running through. So depending on the amount of changes that we've made, um, some of this can take some time. So in this, um, this test, I think the, the duration of the actual failback process takes about five or 10 minutes in total. Um, so I've sped up that part of it. But we can basically see what it's doing there to um, just take a snapshot on the cloud side copy that back and turn the cloud off and turn the local side back on. Uh, and then we turn off those uh, network extension appliances. So the NEA is a very lightweight. So they sit as another VM um, on your existing hypervisor. So you don't need any extra infrastructure or anything like that. Um, it's just a small Linux VM. It uh, uses about uh, a gig of RAM. And uh, so the VM gets created ahead of time. So you always see it there, like you can see in my vSphere on the left but they only get turned on when you're actually um, doing a failover. So we can see here, we've calculated the original signature hard disk. We have replicated that restore point. So that was six minutes and one minute respectively. So once we've done that, then the cloud VMs powered off. And you can see there, my, uh, my pings have stopped running from the, uh, to the machine that was running in the cloud. And we can see it creates that replica restore point. And once we've replicated the changes back down, the local VM's powered back on, and you'll be able to see my vSphere on the left. You can see that machine booting up now. And then you can see the, uh, the network extension appliance will then turn off. And you can see my ping window there. Then goes back to normal, resumes at LAN speeds there. And then if we relay this, we can see we've still got the, uh, the site with the changes that we made in the cloud and they've been replicated um, back to the local site again. So the last thing here is to basically just commit the changes um, of that replica. And what we get, uh, sorry, of the, uh, of the failback. And by doing that, it basically updates Veeam's database. So if you have failed it back to a different location, 
then um, then next time it's going, the job's going to run, it'll make sure that it's reading and writing the same place. So um, we can see in, in this particular scenario, we failed back to the same place. So there won't be any changes that we need to do. Um, I think right. that ends it, anyway. Right? Yeah, that should be it, yeah. Does anyone have any uh, questions? Yeah, thanks for that demo, Kevin. Um, our big um, question was what happens if the, um, like the customer site doesn't exist? Uh, so you're saying in, in terms of failing back if the customer site doesn't exist? No, in terms of like um, if we, um, so let's say the customer has a fire or a flood or something like that, their original yep. servers don't exist. We can obviously um, go to the control site and do a failover from there. But yep. um, without that NEA up, how do you how do you accomplish the route? Uh, okay, so yeah. you're saying without without the customer site, how do you do say a full site failover? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So um, what we can do, we could send you through a few screenshots, but that's all done through control. Um, so so what you what you do ahead of time is you create a, a cloud failover plan, um, and that's what um, that's where we give you the public IP address and you specify your CPU and RAM resources. Um, and you also set your um, your port forwards there as well. So when you need to, um, you, when you need to do a full site failover, you don't need that customer site at all. You basically just log into our um, control console, um, and then just click failover, and it will start that environment up for you. And then is that um, is that set up then? Uh, like we have the IP address ahead of time. Is that failover That's right. um, yeah. saved in control? It is, yeah. It is. So it's got it's got the public IP or IPs that you use that you use, um, uh, and the cloud failover plan will show up there, and it will tell you which machines have turned on and which machines are part of that. Uh, and we obviously include that in the DNS entries or something like yeah, that. Yeah. So, so you like if you've got more than one public IP, then it would be part of your DR plan to say, okay, we'll change this um, this DNS entry to point to this IP, um, and so on and so forth. Great, thanks. Cool. So, Kev, um, there's another question um, through chat um, from Dan. What's the process for seed loading a failback from the cloud? Uh, okay, so for seed loading, um, it's basically, uh, so for DR, you need to run a backup job to a NAS, so not a backup copy job, um, and we can seed that back. Um, for uh, for failback, um, it's basically the similar process. Um, I would, I guess there's a couple of different ways that you can do it. Um, most of the time we see it with seed loading, uh, but not too much for fail back, uh, mainly because obviously with the, the asymmetric bandwidth. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely options for, for both. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so there's a no. So thanks guys, really appreciate your time and I hope you guys have a good day.